State of Teacher Preparation, Research and Stories from Early Years in the Classroom, is a co-production of Regional Educational Laboratory Midwest and Detroit Public Television, with funding provided by RHEL Midwest, through funds provided by the U.S. Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences. Learning to teach is always about learning to teach something. You can't grow if you don't know what you're doing wrong. What is good teaching? How would we know it if we saw it? And that's pushed back on teacher preparation. So now people are thinking deeply about this and they're coming together more to sort of see if they can agree. I wanted to become a teacher because I love making things interesting. I love my kids. I see them growing, I see them changing, and it's amazing. I love children, and I think that I've had some very inspiring teachers when I was growing up. I just always had that passion to become a teacher, and it just stuck with me. We sat down with three novice teachers in Metro Detroit. Their experiences draw parallels to current research on preparing and supporting new teachers. Specifically, the importance of quality preparation, including clinical experience and ongoing mentorship. We also spoke to veteran teachers, school leaders, researchers, and leaders from teacher preparation programs and the Michigan Department of Education about evidence-based best practices for new teacher preparation and support in Michigan and nationally as well as ideas for continued improvement. I went to Detroit Public Schools growing up. I see the needs here now, and I feel like there's no other place that I belong other than teaching in Detroit. Tiffany Ward started her education career as a paraprofessional in 2014 at Highland Park Renaissance Academy. She is still at the same school, but this is now her first year as a certified teacher. There's plenty of evidence that clinical experience matters, but it's not a matter of just many hours. There are some features of it that make it more powerful. Clinical experience is the experience one gains while working in the field, such as in an internship or through student teaching. An effort to get the specific clinical experience needed to be a successful novice teacher in Detroit, Tiffany enrolled in Teach Detroit the teacher residency program offered through Wayne State University. The idea was to create a program that would train people especially to work in Detroit schools and that would also build on the strengths of the city. From the very first day, our students are in a school with children and they'll rehearse an activity and then they go in and for 20 minutes we'll work with children. Training in a context and then having your first job in the same kind of situation, you are going to be a better teacher. And that evidence is pretty strong. It's even stronger if you train in a particular school and end up getting hired there. I did my student teaching at a Detroit public school, Malcolm X Paul Roberson Academy, and then I closed it out here at Highland Park Renaissance Academy teaching summer school. 14, 14, can you make a 10? We looked a lot at how doctors are trained. Those novices are in with more seasoned professionals very early on. You have 10, and then you have how many little boxes do you have? Three. And they teach for half an hour every day in the beginning. Then we start increasing that, and we allow teachers to teach for longer and bigger groups. Also looked at the way athletes train, and that's how we got to the videotaping. Turns out athletes are videotaped frequently and get critique on their videos and actually helps them learn and grow. One of the top concerns for Tiffany as a novice teacher is classroom management, especially since she teaches very young students. She relies on her peers and mentors at Teach Detroit to help her plan her own management strategies. Kindergarten is a hard grade in itself. It's not just always about teaching ABCs and one, two, threes. A lot of the kids have never been to school before. I think that was difficult in the beginning. 
just because she was new and they were new. What comes after five if you're counting by 10? It's different every single day. All right, and your thing's up. They're full of a lot of emotions, and so sometimes when you first walk in the door, it's a lot of what went on this morning or what went on last night. Do you need a hug? How are you feeling? Did you eat breakfast? I get to see the Teach Detroit students that's been in the program with me and some of the new Teach Detroit students. And so we get to share our experiences and really talk about how it's been going for our first year of teaching. And I think a lot of us are having, you know, those same struggles with classroom management. The director of the program, Dr. Lewis, she's been giving us advice. It's normal. It's normal for a first year teacher to have some classroom management issues. And even after 10 years of teaching, you're gonna still have some things that you struggle with. You got to leave space. You see how there's space in between there? The very first thing you need, it comes up again and again in surveys. Teachers say classroom management, understanding how to manage children. Next time, write your answers right below, okay? Because you want to line them up. It's about things like setting classroom norms on day one, telling people what's expected of them, giving them good instructions, learning how to hand out papers, learning how to use the board. Eyes on the smart board. Eyes on the smart board. How to use your voice. It's a performance. Lots of first year teachers leave the profession. Lots more leave by year three. And in large part, it's because they feel that they are not up to the task, the work is overwhelming, they feel that they're ineffective. And it was found that good mentorship made a real difference. While our students are in our program taking courses and going through these clinical experiences with us, they have mentors. But when they graduate, we actually provide what we call induction mentors for the first two years. We offer a lot of support for our new teachers because our instructional coach pretty much works one-on-one -on -one with all of the teachers and we're able to really see how much support each individual teacher needs. We have PLC meetings weekly, which is professional learning community. The teachers are able to meet with one another at least once a week to discuss whatever is pressing that week. I applied to Novi twice throughout the summer. The first time was for a middle school position that they found somebody else for. And the second one was a high school position. Once I got the call, it was every kind of resource that I had was completely invested into this school. Dominic Gliss, like Tiffany, is a novice teacher. He is a science instructor at Novi High School and completed his teacher preparation at Michigan State University. The teacher prep program at Michigan State has us in classrooms starting our first year in it. I went to three different schools for my service learning. And then after we graduate our senior year, you get your degree in your field and then you progress to your internship year. In the internship, they are placed in a classroom four or five days a week. And then on the fifth day, they come back to campus to take graduate level classes that allows really a much longer time for learning to teach and a kind of a back and forth between learning about ideas, trying them out in practice, coming back and reflecting. There are plenty of students or pre-service teachers who when they enter this classroom or as a new teacher, the only preparation they've had is a 12-week internship. That is their only classroom experience. How do you progress on those? When we interview candidates, it becomes very obvious about who's actually had experience. And some of the people we're interviewing have been classroom teachers, and obviously they have a huge advantage because they can speak from classroom experience. Even though Dominic and Tiffany teach in two very different school districts, their needs are similar and include clinical experience as pre-service teachers. Like Tiffany, Dominic also benefits greatly from an on-site mentor, Emily Polonsky. I mentor new teachers in their first couple years here at Novi. And I think the type of mentor I am with each of those individuals is different. With new teacher, it's a lot more directed. There's some really specific things that I want to make sure that they know how to do and can do. Emily's been through so many different types of training. I mean, just unit planning and 
assessment writing, all of these things. And since she's a great teacher herself, she can just give us that information. And she models the behavior that we would want to see out of new teachers like Dominic. We have mentors that are assigned to all new teachers, so each one is paired up with someone who has been, you know, in the field for four to five years minimally. And if they don't have a mentor, I would be really concerned and apprehensive as to whether or not that person would be able to, to be sustainable. Research shows that getting good feedback from a good mentor teacher is powerful. So those are sort of the possible reasons. Because you know when you're in the moment, you can't see it yourself. But having someone observe you, that kind of feedback is very powerful. There are some things that new teachers need, right? They need time. They need to have come in with some content and pedagogy background and then have spaces and opportunities to try new things and to be able to learn from those things and to realize that not everything is gonna be successful the first time. I do not expect them to be the best that they're ever going to be, but I expect that they have what it takes to make sure I would feel okay putting my kid in that room. After that, I expect them to have an attitude that indicates that they get that they're not the best that they're ever going to be and that they want to grow with us. Feedback is so important that it's actually part of the superintendent's top 10 in 10 initiative. His goal is to be the top 10 state in 10 years. I think it's the single most beneficial way in which a teacher can be supported is have somebody that's able to give critical feedback and also be a partner with somebody else as a mentor and share feedback with them. Blue and yellow make what color? Green. Green? I've always had an aptitude for children and people always told me I should be a teacher. Imani Sims comes from a teaching family and attended private and charter schools while growing up in Detroit. She is a former Teach for America Corps member and is finishing up her second year as a kindergarten teacher at Munger, a K-8 Detroit public school. During her first year, she did not have any significant mentorship. There is no formal mentorship program within Detroit Public Schools, which, quite honestly, I, I wish there was one because I was, I was so lost last year. The biggest thing, I guess, is that Ms. Brigo came in. When I first met her, she was just full of life. Today we're going to talk about things that are as big as a fire truck. And was very much like, hey, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing. This is who I am as a person. I really enjoy helping people. Fortunately, one experienced Detroit educator took the initiative to change the situation for Imani by serving as an informal mentor to her. The very first day of school, we met each other. We have adjoining classrooms. Um, I took this, teach, this classroom over from a teacher that was retiring. So I went through the first seven years of my career without a mentor, not only without a mentor, but without a evaluation by an administrator. So I had no feedback on my teaching whatsoever. As far as having a mentor, being assigned a mentor, that didn't happen in my career ever, ever, until I, um, 13 years in, went to National Board Certification, and that's when I first discovered what a mentor was, someone who helps you through the process, someone who helped you reflect and think about teaching, and that's when I think it clicked for me that this is a key element in this career. I saw older teachers asking her for help, and I didn't feel like some dumb young kid asking her for help because like other people, she A, she offered, B, she was all about teamwork, C, she seemed to be okay with a reciprocal relationship. The mentor has to want to mentor as much as the mentee wants to have the mentoring. I don't have to worry as much about what I'm doing myself in the classroom. I can now share that skill and knowledge. It's taken 20 plus years, but I, I feel that I've gotten there. It was really nice to have Miss Briegel, especially because like our doors are like, I can literally walk into her room from my room and she can walk into mine and just say, hey, just checking in on you, where I can say, hey, I don't know what's going on, <laughs> please help me. There's something about feeling like you're alone or maybe you're doing everything wrong and you don't know because there's nothing to compare to. Like Tiffany, Imani deals with classroom management issues while teaching kindergartners. And also like Tiffany, Imani learned from her mentor that what she is dealing with is not uncommon. 
it was rough. It's tough to be in charge of 25 kids and manage all those multiple behaviors when still in yet learning what I, my craft and what I need to know how to do and what to do. It's the management that has to really be done on site. It's not something you can read in a book. You, you just have to do it. You have to be part of it, and it's a learning process. Through wise mentorship, the learning process can be accelerated for new teachers. But again, Ms. Briegel is just an informal mentor who is there for Imani only because of circumstance. Four years ago in Detroit Public Schools, I oversaw a first-year teacher mentoring program. To this day, those teachers will contact me via email or see me at a workshop now um, and thank me for the little things that they learned. Detroit, we need to get back to that. We need to get back to specific trainings just for them. One of the most daunting challenges in education today is the recruitment and retention of new teachers. One of the interesting things going on in teacher prep right now is that enrollment's down across the board in every kind of program in every place. There was a survey done by a group called Third Way in Washington, and they surveyed the top 50% of graduates of universities, and they asked them their perceptions of the teaching profession. Is this something they wanted to do? Is teaching an easy major? Is it a well-respected thing? Does it pay well? And it was all negative. While problems with recruitment and retention of new teachers might be caused by a variety of issues, pay is one reason that consistently came up in our interviews. Probably one of the most phenomenal teachers I've seen in years, I mentored last year and she left in October this year. Um, I don't blame her, wonderful for her, I think it was great, but it broke my heart because the, the kids need great teachers like that. How do we keep them? <laughs> Pay <laughs> might be one way. I'm a science teacher by day and by night I'm a football coach, a spring athletic aide, and a cook. I'm 25 years old, I have a lot of energy. I don't know how many years I can do working three jobs. It's tough. Quite honestly, if I were to get married and start a family and my, my salary didn't raise, I wouldn't be a teacher anymore. Even though I love it, even though it makes me so happy, I could not afford it. I just wouldn't be able to. No one comes here because they think they're going to make a lot of money, but there is a limit into what people are willing to do. Our program costs about $25,000, and that's not including the loss of income that our pre-service teachers have because they're not working. But if we continue to have that kind of tuition cost, we already lose out on a whole bunch of people who don't have the ability to pay that. Beyond just pay, the problem of recruiting and retaining new teachers may have as much to do with the public perception of teaching as anything else. And I think what has changed more is kind of the public discourse around teaching, around these ideas that there is no support, that it's so hard, that you're evaluated right away, that you have these high stakes assessments, that you have no flexibility anymore, you just teach what people give you. There's so little curriculum but so high expectation and test score. And so that makes it really hard for a newer teacher to come in. You're expected to have a little bigger bag of tricks than you already have, and you're new. You, you don't have it. It's been very easy to blame teacher preparation and the act of teaching for student failure, when I believe it actually is a host of issues surrounding. There are systemic problems around what is happening in schools. There are systemic poverty issues that are greatly impacting student achievement across the state. And until we kind of own it as a team and a set of partners and provide all of the wraparounds, 
resources that we need for students to be successful. We're, it's not a problem we're going to solve just by changing the way we teach teachers to teach, especially if we can't keep them there longer than five years. With the challenges laid out, educators and experts are implementing changes now to teacher preparation and looking at more strategies that could impact the future in very positive ways. People in the K-12 world very much only see teacher preparation as the way that they went through it, regardless of how long ago that was and what type of experience that they had. And um, our core group is already out there communicating the things that they have learned about teacher preparation, and that in itself is huge. Our new teachers indicate that they really do need additional mentoring and induction. If clinical experiences are included to a greater degree, let's make sure that they are the right kind of clinical experiences and not just clocking hours in any school with any kind of um, teacher and doing any old thing. I've heard proposals and ideas and districts trying things where teachers are in the classroom part-time and supporting novices part-time, or the novice teacher is not working a full load, right, but is only working part of their load. And the other part of their work is around learning to teach, around being supported, around getting to know the school and community. There are some ideas, and we've been trying them here at MSU, around technology also, and really having kind of distributed support where cohorts of students, say, leaving here and going into new, their first years of teaching in lots of geographically dispersed places can still have that community. We would like to see better quality clinical experiences. We'd like to see greater diversity in those placements so teachers are working with a wider variety of students in K-12 settings. So MD has developed a plan that addresses recruitment, placement, support, professional learning, and we are aiming strategies at the entire system. Although novice teachers do encounter many challenges, they also achieve successes worth celebrating, particularly if they receive adequate support and assistance. Of course, the defining feature of a great teacher is passion why I decided to stay here for my first year of teaching is just that camaraderie and knowing that there's people that I can go to and lean on and I can get support from and I know who has my back. Your fingers, that's good. As of right now, my long-term plans are really up in the air, but I know for the next two or three years, I plan to be teaching in the classroom. Not perfecting it, because I'll probably never be perfect, but just getting to that expert level of classroom management, of teaching the curriculum, and just of being a great teacher. I think for Miss Ward, the sky's the limit. A really good characteristic that I talk about when I talk about people and working with them is them being coachable. She's incredibly coachable. If she asks me something and I give her some advice, she takes that advice and she goes with it. When you see that light bulb go off or when they come to you and say, Miss War, I can read this sentence or Miss War, I read this book all on my own. It's nothing more rewarding than seeing the students light up and to see them learn. And I don't have any children as of yet, but all of the kids in my class, those are my babies. They are my kids. My advice to Miss Ward or, or new teachers is don't be afraid to ask for help and don't be embarrassed. Build positive relationships. Relationship building is key. I wanted to become a teacher because I love making things interesting. My goal was to try to bring in everybody and get everybody to feel connected to what was going on in the classroom. I still learn all the time from Dominic. It helps me stay fresh and it forces me to be more reflective of my own practice. And I think about all the kids that are in his room, they deserve a great teacher and we are so grateful that we have him. I'm still just in awe every day of the things that I see from the kids that I work with and the colleagues that I have. It's just incredible to be in a place like this. The reason why I keep going is because I feel like I really don't have any bad days here. Observing him this year has been a breath of fresh air for me. There's something about the environment that he's established, the relationships that he has with the kids. Yeah, I mean, it gives me chills just talking about it. I got choked up last week talking. I mean, I, that's not normal. Like, to get choked up talking to a first-year teacher during their end-of-the-year evaluation meeting is not the norm. But it's like the level of excitement that he has about this profession and the pride that he has in the profession. If I could bottle it up and pass it out, I would. When I came in, the first thing Imani and I did was 
chatted about some things, about the building, about the atmosphere, about the students. I believe I even said to her, I'm here to help you as much as I'm here to get help from you. And from that point, we clicked. So it's without a doubt a two-way street. And I was excited that I would be learning about a new culture because I'm African-American and most of my kids are Hispanic. I was excited that I would be able to teach them the things that my mom taught me and show them the things that my mom showed me and just expose them to this whole new world and watch them grow teaching children how to learn and teaching children to fall in love with learning is, it's so exciting. It's so great. Oh, sorry, I get really excited about like, teaching. It's so much fun. State of Teacher Preparation, Research and Stories from Early Years in the Classroom is a co-production of Regional Educational Laboratory Midwest and Detroit Public Television with funding provided by RHEL Midwest through funds provided by the U.S. Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences. This program was funded by Track Research Group.